Right. Ready to get started here. <clears throat> so, uh, thank you everyone for joining uh, uh, the AZ Water um, virtual luncheon today. Um, we have a really fantastic presentation that that Aaron has put together, and uh, I just have some some just upfront slides here to cover, and then I'll be turning it over to our presenter Aaron Young. Um, if you need PDH certificates, those this uh, presentation qualifies for one. Um, so if you have registered, you should automatically get, receive your PDH certificates. Um, if you are watching the uh, the presentation on YouTube and uh, require a PDH, then you can contact uh, Shana Schwartz with AZ Water, and her email is listed here. And without further ado, today's presentation is an um, update on Flagstaff Reclaimed Water System, and our speaker is Erin Young. Um, Erin is the Water Resources Manager for City of Flagstaff. And uh, she's been in this role since 2013, and she was recently the acting director uh, for the Water Services Department uh, for about five months. Uh, prior to joining the, the City of Flagstaff, Erin um, worked for about 11 years in consulting also in the water resources arena. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Erin uh, to start sharing her slides and walk us through the presentation. Thank you, Brenda. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. It is a pleasure to be sharing our lunch hour together. Um, let's see. So it looks like I am sharing my screen. Brenda, can you see my screen, my PowerPoint? Yes, we can see your PowerPoint uh, and it's in full screen mode now. Perfect. Um, well, add to my bio that um, I'm the Arizona Water Reuse Treasurer. So I've been part of Water Reuse now for maybe five years. Uh, and since we're talking reuse today, I thought I'd share that. Um, so yeah, I thought uh, the folks out there might be interested in hearing an update on our reuse program. I called it the evolution of our reuse program because things are really changing. We've been um, kind of on a straight course um, since the 90s, and now we're kind of changing course uh, given the new opportunities for reclaimed water and reuse in Arizona. So an outline for my talk is I, I'll just provide some background on Flagstaff's water supplies. Uh, reclaimed water could augment our surface water source, for example. So I just thought um, some background would be helpful. And then I'll talk through the potable reuse options for Flagstaff. We elected to involve some of our community members in, in the decision process for how we reuse the water that we do have. So I'll talk about that process, information that we're working to pull together um, to develop an action plan to present to City Council. So just some history, Flagstaff is where it is today because of some springs in Northern Arizona that brought the railroad here. And uh, we have a 12 mile pipeline from the inner basin of the San Francisco peaks that comes to town. And we have two surface water reservoirs in the Walnut Canyon watershed, Lower Lake Mary and Upper Lake Mary. And Lower Lake Mary doesn't actually hold much water because of what I'm showing in this video. Um, we have first capacity um, and sinkholes that drains the Lower Lake. Uh, that's why the Upper Lake Mary reservoir was built in 1941. We started developing wells in the 50s to the deep sea aquifer, which is anywhere from a couple 300 feet to 1500 feet below land surface. That's the starting uh, static water level pre-development. And uh, Continental Country Club was a golf course. Well, we still have uh, the Continental Golf Course is using reclaimed water. So that goes back to the 60s. Um, we developed wells within the inner basin, so shallow wells within um, glacial sediments in the 60s. And then we built a broader reclaimed water system that I'll get into a little later uh, in 93 with um, the uh, Rio de Flag 
water reclamation plant, which was constructed in the mid 90s to provide class A plus water to um, a lot of outdoor water use, uses that would otherwise be on potable wa water. And it wasn't until uh, the 90s that we started to drill wells within our city limits that we call the inner city wells. Our direct delivery reclaimed water system, um, the majority of this system was actually built, like I said, in the 90s um, after constructing the Rio de Flag water reclamation plant. Uh, Wildcat Hill was built, I think, in like 71, and a water line uh, from Wildcat directly delivers reclaimed water to the Continental Golf Courses and Aspen uh, Golf Course. Um, but yeah, the majority of the system is about 26 miles long. We have about 70 customers, and the system really hasn't changed much since the 90s. In terms of our water sources to meet water demand over the course of, well, the past 60, 70 years, uh, we were fully on surface water until we started uh, drilling those wells in the 50s to the sea aquifer. So we're, we're looking at um, acre feet of water over time and, and how we met that demand. The purple is showing reclaimed water, uh, the orange groundwater. There are several, um, dips here where we were um, we had very little surface water upper lake mary was essentially dry and the first two um, really dry events in 89 and 02 or so is where our city council took pretty aggressive water conservation action um, and it was in 2020 when they adopted a water conservation strategic plan but as you can see we weren't really under any stress of not having a surface water supply um, but we're realizing how valuable water conservation is when we're trying to uh, where we're talking about meeting future demands um, this greenish line um, represents the volume of reclaimed water effluent that discharged and not direct delivered. And so you can see that totals about 4,000 acre feet a year. Uh, and so there's just a great potential to either augment um, surface water with that or uh, recharge to the groundwater to the sea aquifer or direct deliver that um, if, if we can find more customers. Um, in terms of how much water we need in the future, we're looking uh, here from 2017 out into the future. This is these are our sources that we've pledged under our designation of adequate water supply, uh, which we achieved in 2013 with the Department of Water Resources. So we're looking at a demand curve, assuming 104 gallons per capita per day and a 2.2% growth rate. Um, and looking at when we exhaust the supplies in our designation and um, need to prove our our the idea was uh, use utilizing Red Gap Ranch which, as a future groundwater source, um, which is in our designation. We just have to um, have the pipeline constructed by a point in time when we need that water. Um, so based on this curve, we're looking at by like 2034, we would need an additional supply of water. And um, however, um, with our water conservation efforts, we're uh, setting a goal of achieving an eight, total GPCD of 80, um, which pushes out the need for an additional supply to about 2047. Um, water conservation, uh, we're doing what we can where it is cheaper than purchasing a new supply, um, but reuse presents such a great potential. We want to see uh, what we can achieve with reuse as well, um, if that's cheaper or desirable by the community to push off a, a project such as Red Gap Ranch. So how much water are we talking about with um, the uncommitted reclaimed water available? So the chart on the right um, is showing that potential of about 4,000 acre feet in a year. The chart on the left is showing the seasonality of that supply. 
um, you'll see that uh, this is sort of shown quarterly over over about five year time period, seven year time period. But every May um, and June, we have very little supply available. Uh, whereas in the winter months, uh, September through um, April or so, that's when we have the excess supply available. So this was a consideration coming into our reclaimed water master plan. If we're talking about like direct potable reuse, is it even feasible if we're not, um, if we have to direct deliver to our current customers, do we have enough remaining to make like a direct potable reuse plant uh, feasible, for example. Um, so this is, uh, the volume is about half of our total potable used annually. So there's a lot of potential here. Is potable reuse a viable alternative for Flagstaff? Uh, the pieces are starting to fall into place with our uh, city council and some community members saying, hey, is reuse cheaper than Red Gap Ranch? Um, However, some on city council and some in our community are concerned with the reclaimed water quality we have today uh, and compounds of emerging concern. And is our reclaimed water a source of CECs if we were to recharge the aquifer with that reclaimed um, quality we have today? Um, and we've received funding from city council. I think we're actually over $500,000 in the last um, eight years or so uh, investing in studies to help us sort out um, the possibilities. And I think it's old news now. So, um, but with the ADQ lifting the prohibition of DPR in 2018 direct potable reuse. Um, and I just like this um, quote a lot from Chuck Graff because uh, even though no utilities are necessarily doing this yet in their community other than like Scottsdale with the pilot project, um, it's just, it opens the door for the conversation and we see a path for Flagstaff if we were to go with like direct potable reuse, at least um, it's an option. Uh, ADEQ is, is on board. So in terms of our path to potable reuse, um, we have invested, as I said, in a lot of studies. So going back to 2017, Corolla provided us with a potable reuse alternative study. Um, th this was kind of our first conceptual look at um, how, where we would put a direct potable reuse plant, where we would advance treat, whether we, we advance treat at the Rio de Flag water reclamation plant or the Wildcat plant or both, or, um, or at our, our surface water drinking water plant, um, our surface water treatment plant. So just kind of conceptual uh, level five engineering cost estimate uh, study. And then we had Brown and Caldwell perform a potable reuse feasibility study, what we call inside the fence, which is um, within the extent of land we have at both of our, well, our, our um, surface water treatment facility on Lake Mary Road and then our two water reclamation plants. Can we fit uh, direct potable reuse within that footprint? And that came with more of a, a level four cost estimate for the treatment trains that they presented. Uh, then in 2018, Corolla pro provided us with a biosolids master plan. And really that plan addresses capacity needs. We are basically at our solids capacity at the Wildcat plant. The real plant is a, is a scalping plant and the solids go to Wildcat. We're at capacity. That plan is about 20 years old. We've reached, uh, we have redundancy issues. So the biosolids master plan is about expanding the plant, um, but also bringing in um, a wastewater treatment process that aligns with potable reuse. So setting us up for advanced treatment. Um, We've done some preliminary aquifer recharge testing, which we would need sort of that evidence to go forward to the Department of Water Resources if we wanted to get a recharge permit, recharge and recovery, so intentional direct potable, re well, that would be indirect potable reuse. 
Um, and then we have our newest work, which was with Brown and Caldwell, a reclaimed water master plan. And they subcontracted work to Westwater Research uh, so we could answer some of our questions regarding pricing of reclaimed water in Flagstaff and the economic value of water. So for the remainder of this talk, I'm going to focus on um, the latest work that we've done um, on our community stakeholder committee process, and then this like um, pricing policies and allocation considerations involving the economic value of water. So we thought um, this was kind of too big of an effort to present to our water commission, which meets monthly, but that is a council elected uh, body who oversees water issues. We just thought that this was um, an issue that we wanted to spend more time with, with like a stakeholder committee. So we solicited um, just members from of the public, engineering consultants are maybe some of our large customers. We kind of reached out to everyone, the community, and, and asked for applications to serve on the stakeholder committee. And this started um, just before um, COVID hit when in March 2020, we were largely working um, from home, a lot of us. Um, so we were able to execute this during that time. We selected um, 13 community members that we thought had a, a nice cross-section cross representation of the community and their knowledge of reclaimed water um, issues in Flagstaff. So what options do we have for reuse? Um, we have the two water reclamation plants generating reclaimed water. Um, there's a little bit of on-site use at the Wildcat Hill plant, um, but our direct delivered water goes to parks and schools, commercial users, golf courses. We have some residential users, and then we have an agreement with the Game and Fish um, uh, for release to environmental flows. Um, but annually, we have this available excess reclaimed water that we could, that is surface water discharge now, um, but we could expand our purple pipe system um, with direct delivery. We have these indirect potable reuse options that include just um, releasing water to the Rio de Flag or other areas of Flagstaff where we see the recharge benefit. We can get a recharge and recovery permit. We could also do that with, with wells, through injection wells, um, or aquifer storage and recovery wells. Um, and then we have the direct, or in another indirect option is augmentation of our upper Lake Mary. Um, and then we have direct potable reuse. So I won't spend much time talking about each of the options. I'll spend more time talking about kind of the, how we went into this process of um, just vetting all of these options with our stakeholder committee. Uh, these are some of the considerations that we thought of going into the process. Um, let's see, I think I have. Um, so on the right is just an example of, of our current um, direct reuse purple pipe um, overlaying on our future growth illustration map in our regional plan. So um, just one option is where could we expand the system? Um, Expansion is already in our city code and recharge is already, recharge and recovery is already in our city code as well. Um, and in our 2014 council adopted water policies. So it kind of makes it easy um, to do those two options. Um, and that's kind of been the path we're on, but it's come up that CECs are concerned um, at least Several community members are voicing those opinions to city council. City council is concerned, um, and they'd like to understand uh, CECs more um, before making these important decisions. Um, other ideas um, is are sort of revisiting the economic impact that our current users of reclaimed water have in our community if 
economics is important to um, our decision makers. Uh, should economics be the single driver of um, who we allocate reclaimed water to, or you know, if we go with um, direct potable reuse? Um, so what are those kind of values that we want to look through as we assess our alternatives? Um, it's expensive to hook up into the system. So um, these are just some of the um, items we wanted to tackle with our consultants. Um, the cost to hook up into our system, uh, we the city actually incentivized those hookups in the 90s to like Northern Arizona University, Pine Canyon Golf Course. Uh, we paid them back over time. So are we still willing to do that? Or do we want uh, maybe capacity fees to pay for system expansion? Um, so I'll focus first on the first two bullets and then come back um, to this slide to explain what I'll be talking about um, as we go forward. But in terms of CECs, um, Brown and Caldwell um, really laid the foundation for, with our stakeholder committee, um, with where we should go if we are concerned with CECs. So here's a slide on Arizona's current regulatory approach, which you're probably familiar with um, these uh, rules that we're working under. Um, and the requirements of these permitting or these agencies. Um, so with class A plus reclaimed water, you know, we're using water in Flagstaff for a lot of these um, listed uses already, including snowmaking at Snowball, which is very controversial. Um, and the fact that our community is interested in going beyond class A plus, it's tricky for us, um, you know, as a utility, well, what is the standard that we adopt as a community when there isn't one um, already out there? Uh, with the exception of direct portable reuse, which I, you know, there should be um, a standard being developed, but in between for indirect portable reuse, um, it's interesting to think about how we might hold ourselves accountable to our own kind of standards. So um, what Brown and Caldwell um, suggested is referencing the um, NWRI uh, guidance framework for direct potable reuse in Arizona. Um, um, I believe so. Um, anyway, which recommends, I'm sorry, three tiers of, of monitoring. So uh, the primary drinking water standards, and this is for monitoring um, uh, treated effluent and reclaimed water, um, and I believe DPR water. That's sort of the, um, these are the guidelines for those uh, sources of water. And then tier two, uh, we have the UCMR and the CCL, and then tier three are other chemicals, which I'll um, get into. And I'm borrowing this straight from Brown and Caldwell, so I have to give them kudos for these slides and, and th this information. Um, but here's an example of tier one constituents. Um, we're saying 105 chemicals. Um, Really, City of Flagstaff is is very sensitive to the use of chemicals, so we say compounds or constituents. Here are examples of what we'd be sampling for, so we are we're all pretty familiar with tier one, um, tier two, uh, the uncontaminated monitoring rule, um, which UCMR CCL lists, um, and um, there is an EPA provisional short-term health advisory for these um, contaminants. And um, those would include like the PFAS and the 1,4-dioxane and such. Um, and then tier three have no known or identified health or environmental risks. Um, and then the examples include sucralose and caffeine and such. Um, so Flagstaff has actually sampled for a lot of these constituents um, many years ago in about 2015-16, I believe. 
um, under our city manager's panel on CECs. So this has come up in Flagstaff in the past that our reclaimed water is, is um, harmful to people um, and how we're using it today. So the city manager formed the CEC panel. And um, so I do have some results from those sampling efforts to share, but just um, to give you a flavor of our industrial users, um, we have seven significant industrial users and two non-categorical users, and they provide um, medical bottling laundry services. We have a dog food manufacturer, we have an ice cream cone manufacturer and biomedical equipment manufacturing. So that's what's coming into our system. Um, and as I said, we did test in the past. Um, so we tested for 97 CECs in all from Eaton Analyticals. I think they had a recommendation, a recommended list of, of what to sample for. Um, and we sampled at our reclaimed water plant, the effluent, and five locations in our uh, reclaimed distribution system. So you can see here what was detected. Um, and so we're seeing some um, in our systems, and uh, we'd like to take Brown and Caldwell's recommendation, I believe this isn't um, coming from city council, I guess this is my personal opinion. At this point, my recommendation is that we um, add to this list with the recommendations of the NWRI report. Um, and then our data on the forever chemicals um, under the UCMR. Um, we are getting non-detects on all of those things at our entry points to the distribution system. We haven't sampled these for reclaimed water, which is a, a reason why I recommend um, to, uh, as a staff person, that we, we see if we've got um, these uh, contaminants entering our wastewater treatment plant or exiting our wastewater treatment plant. Um, so the enhanced sampling program um, that was suggested by Brown and Caldwell in the Reclaimed Water Master Plan um, is listed here. Uh, we've costed out the sampling effort um, for all three tiers, which now include UCMR5 and CCR5, at being around $30,000. And I think we could elect to not sample for everything since we've done some sampling in the past, which would um, get us down closer to the $20,000 investment level. Um, but here are some recommendations on, you know, if we see the PFAS, then maybe we look at our biosolids. Um, and if we're going with advanced treatment, uh, we should begin testing our wastewater influent to inform the advanced treatment um, process or uh, what treatment trains would be recommended. Um, of course, we need to understand where uh, the point of the advanced treatment, if it's IPR or DPR. Um, so that's kind of my wrap up for the CEC's conversation, the first two bullets, and then the next bunch of bullets were addressed by Westwater Research. So I wanted to share kind of the highlights from, from their work. Um, so they looked at, um, they provided us with an idea of like the various methods for pricing reclaimed water. We've, um, we used to be the benchmark to potable. Um, we set rates at, I think, 25% uh, of potable many years ago in the 90s. Uh, that has gone up. I think now we might be at 35% of potable. There's always pushback if we want to go up from our users. Um, the golf courses um, in particular, just because they set their business model on cheap water and now we're wanting to increase it. Where we have moved though to um, cost of service, reclaimed water now pays for itself. So that occurred in about 2008 or so. Um, that was at least important to our city council to say that we're not subsidizing reclaimed water, although there were conversations on where you draw the line of, of what treatment costs on the wastewater side or even the water production side should factor into the cost of service. Um, we draw that line um, 
at, uh, I guess, our, our commitment to just treating uh, wastewater. Uh, we have to tr we have to treat it regardless if we want to use it as reclaimed water. So we draw the line at the end of the treatment process, and then the cost of service is um, to disinfect and then have our distribution system. Um, so that makes water the cost of service a little cheaper. Um, but these other, um, such as uh, thinking of of reclaimed water as having a market value, an environmental value. We hadn't given that into consideration, at least in the time I've been here. So these are the kind of um, conversations we wanted to open up uh, with the stakeholder group. It's just these additional ideas for how we view our, our reclaimed water and the value it has in the community. Um, so what I'm showing here, um, the upper right is um, West Water pulled together the cost, the unit price of reclaimed water for different communities in Arizona. Uh, you can see that and it's uh, organized on the X axis by the service population. Uh, we're about 70,000 people in Flagstaff and our Water rates um, are between 466 and over $1,500 an acre foot because we actually have customer classes with uh, a range of consumption or a range of pricing per thousand gallons. So we have tiered rates for um, residential. Um, we used to have an inverse block for golf course and off peak users. So anyway, we have a range of costs. Um, and oh, in 93, it looks like reclaimed rates were set to 75% of potable, um, which dropped. And I, I said that incorrectly earlier in my talk, so I apologize for that. Um, and on the lower left, we're just looking at our kind of monthly allocations. Um, the gray in the winter months is mainly, mainly snowball. Uh, for commercial, and then it, mainly in the summer, we're serving golf courses. So thinking about, um, you know, comparing our, you know, just how we value and price reclaimed water in Flagstaff, it's awesome to have a comparison, just see how other communities in Arizona are pricing reclaimed water. So here's a great chart of, or, um, <laughs> table of, of that. Um, and from this, um, we've learned uh, that most rates are based on a cost of service. Um, we're the only one of this group with um, an increasing block. Um, otherwise, you know, most are uniform set uniformly set rates um, and then um, I guess that's all I want to cover here is we're kind of in the middle in terms of our costs of, of all these communities. Um, so we just kind of talked about rate considerations and really um, I think our utility is at a point where we we want to set maybe some goals, whether those are financial goals for recovery um, driven by economics, um, but maybe there are other drivers which gets into kind of the policy considerations, um, uh, whether we want to promote consumption or conservation, uh, or if we want to get into like allocation policies that include like environmental, the, the value of environmental allocations, um, whether we want to incentivize development um, and what that looks like for the summer months where we're already short on water, um, we'd have to build, expand our systems. So just do we want to invest in that? Um, or is does potable reuse have a, is, it, is that a best and higher value? Uh, so looking at value, methods of value such as land use, uh, west water, um, kind of boiled down our land use types into the categories you see here. And um, they developed kind of this uh, model of economic value. 
the uh, estimated economic value generated um, through water use and different land uses is equal to the net revenue per unit of land area divided by the net water demand per unit of land area for each land use land use type. So then we have a a relative ranking of land use types that generate higher or lower average economic values for the city uh, through water use. So looking at what that looks like, um, uses that generate relatively high net revenues and relatively low net water demand are the water uses that have the highest economic value per unit of water. So commercial has a high contribution to tax revenue with relatively low water use. Um, Snowball brings high tourism and sales tax con contribution with very low costs incurred by the city. Um, and residential has a contribution to sales and property tax with relatively low water use. So um, it's interesting, I think, for us as we maybe present these things to council to kind of look through this lens if, if economics is the driver. Another method of value that Westwater presented to us is a market value um, as another strategy for determining the economic value of reclaimed water um, and comparable market transactions for the resource. Um, so this gives us an estimate of the intrinsic value of the resource at the point of production based on what other ent entities have paid. And um, they presented us with several recent examples of these transactions in Arizona. Um, these transactions are suggesting that the market value of reclaimed water is between 60 and $350 per, um, per acre foot per year. Um, although it depends on the application. Um, so reclaimed water, so for example, reclaimed water transactions that serve environmental purposes are in some cases priced lower than those that serve municipal or industrial purposes. Um, and our current rates charged by the city, you know, we're at over $400 an acre foot up to $1,500 an acre foot, depending on the customer class and level of consumption, those are above the market prices. Um, however, the price of reclaimed water charged by the city of Flagstaff is set to recover distribution and capital improvement costs. So there's no value assigned to the water resource itself. Um, so this is, um, these are just awesome considerations for us as we <laughs> look at the value of, of this remaining supply and whether there might be market considerations. Um, and I'm happy to share the, the Westwater report if there's interest out there. Um, they dive into these details, um, obviously, in their report. So uh, within the city's existing allocation uh, policy, so this is another method of value um, is uh, kind of policy and um, priority driven, which is what we have now. Um, however, there is ambiguity around how to allocate limited supplies among competing users, and we, we haven't sorted that out yet. Uh, we've tried to in the past, and it just gets um, sticky, I guess, you know, probably just because um, it gets a little more personal with how our community values water. Um, so it may be appropriate to refine the allocation pro policy to define which use types that offset potable, de potable demand are preferred and how community benefit is defined for the purpose of allocation decisions. So this is something that city council has asked for it, that staff uh, need to bring forward with them. So here are the considerations that Westwater has recommended to us. So um, our existing customers, are these the best, most preferred uses? Although we do have agreements with them. So um, we do have a system to reviewing existing agreements. Is that adequate um, at this time? and looking forward. Um, and if we're, we have some new uses, how are they, you know, what, which ones are preferable? How is that decision made? Um, 
And then within those uses, what are our drivers um, generating that community benefit? So a lot to a lot to think about and talk about. And then the the cost per acre foot is is obviously really important to the community if we're comparing these alternatives to something like Red Gap Ranch, which is a 40 mile pipeline. Uh, Red Gap Ranch is 2,000 feet lower in elevation, so that's obviously uh, an expensive project. Um, so Westwater looked to the Corolo cost estimates as just um, a high level. It is a high level conceptual study. Um, and so, however, it still provides us with relative costs um, as a starting point for, for conversation, although it's subject to change, of course, um, as we um, as we develop uh, additional studies. So um, I thought this was really interesting because uh, the left bar is showing the um, dollars, the annualized cost of just um, our, our current drinking water fund budget uh, and the acre feet of water that we get um, today from our current sources. So then comparing that to the additions of, of all the alternatives that we have with indirect potable reuse and direct potable reuse and then Red Gap Ranch. So um, this is, uh, you know, it's helpful to have this information um, for a productive dialogue with folks when we're talking about, well, what's it going to cost us? Uh, and then taking it um, a step further to looking at the present value unit cost estimate as compared to uh, other projects in the Southwest. So the two left bars are indirect potable reuse with um, via well recharge and surface water blending. Um, the next bars to the right are, you know, we're looking at direct potable reuse um, at Lake Mary versus Wildcat Hill Water Reclamation Plant. And the error bars are reflecting what Brown and Caldwell's report um, on the inside the fence costs might be given the different treatment trains that we might go with um, before, you know, we're kind of waiting for Arizona to perhaps define what treatment trains we have to use, or they might leave it open to, um, you know, just establishing the regulations that we have to meet where we could develop our treatment trains to meet that. So anyway, that's kind of the, the costs that we might see, the range in costs. Um, and then comparing those to some big projects um, in other parts of the Southwest. So now, uh, coming back to this slide, I'll, I'll end with um, the community values portion that we wanted to get out of the process. And let's see what time I have here, 12.44, so hopefully I'm okay to finish up. Um, yeah, we have, sorry? I was just saying, you're doing good on time. Okay, thank you. I think I have like a couple slides left, so. Um, so stakeholder input on community values, um, entering in the information we just talked about into a series of workshops, and we really wanted to hear from them. Um, what do you think our Flagstaff community is going to value, or how will they want to address these alternatives and 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 uh, kind of matrix them um, to score them? So the draft values that came out of this effort include a focus on the health and quality of the of the supplies and on the um, alternatives themselves. Uh, the sustain different views on sustainability, how this um, helps with a sustainable water future for Flagstaff, how these different options uh, play into that lens and then of course energy efficiency we do have a climate action uh, a carbon neutrality goal i think of 2030 um, but we have a an aggressive goal so obviously energy efficiency is really important and then um, thinking about quality of life and including the aquatic and riparian habitats and that environment uh, is important to the group and respecting our indigenous community members and their um, beliefs um, and our downstream users as well. 
Um, so our tribal neighbors and then equity, just thinking about how all this, um, the cost of, of bringing these uh, alternatives online and how that impacts our community. So out of the effort with the stakeholders, the main drivers going forward um, are kind of defining the best use of the water resource and looking at reliability and sustainability and aesthetics. Kind of a summary of, of what I just um, showed on the previous slide. Um, these are sort of the um, topics that staff will focus on in terms of presenting this to, to council. Um, this is such an important investment that we want to take our time um, so that, um, you know, we're not making decisions um, short sighted. And this is my last slide um, as a summary of um, the, the big picture issues we heard from our stakeholder group and then how we can improve on having the information to help with this decision making process. So we've done a lot in Flagstaff on reuse and reuse is exciting. So this is my last slide. Um, and with the exception of next steps. Um, so that's that's what I have for AZ Water today for your lunch. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. That was a fascinating presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I was really intrigued by those, uh, those numbers, kind of the relative value. Of, of reclaimed water as a resource and seems like an elusive number to actually put a put your finger on and say that's that's the value right yes so. yes yes for sure <laughs> great presentation and great work um so does anybody have questions um for Eric? Silence. I'm going to take it as there's no questions, but uh, we really do appreciate the the time and effort you put into this, Erin. And I'm sure more of our members will be watching this uh, once it's up on the YouTube channel. Perfect. Yes. All Thank right. you, Brianna. Thank or you. Brenda. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Appreciate it. Um, have a good good afternoon. You too. All right. Thanks, everyone.